Report from Santa Fe is made possible in part by grants from the members of the National Education Association of New Mexico, an organization of professionals who believe that investing in public education is an investment in our state's economic future, and by a grant from the Healy Foundation, Taos, New Mexico. Hello, I'm Lorraine Mills, and welcome to Report from Santa Fe. I'm delighted that our guest today is Senator Jeff Bingaman. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. You served as New Mexico Senator in the U.S. Senate from uh, 1983 to 2013, 30 years in the Senate. And while you were there, you chaired some crucial committees, the Energy and Natural Resources Committee, yikes, and uh, the Finance Committee, you've just been, you were at at the heartbeat of all the things our country was trying to do. You were also an attorney general before you became our senator. And I have been thinking, watching Washington these days, wondering if I could find, if there were a statesman, someone who I really trusted, to talk to me about his perspective, what you see. So let's talk, I'd like to ask you about what's happening in Washington now. Let's start with your perspective as a senator, because the Senate is going through extremely trying times right now. So if you wouldn't mind, what do you see when you look at what's happening in Washington now? Well, what I see is uh, during the time I was there, things changed quite a bit from the time I got there till the time I left. <clears throat> and one of the unfortunate changes was that uh, the Republican leadership there, both in the House and Senate, started using some tactics uh, in their negotiations with Democratic presidents, with Clinton and uh, Obama in particular. Uh, And the tactics were to threaten to shut down the government or to shut it down. That was one tactic. And the other was to threaten uh, default on the national debt. And and so they they went used used those at various points in the process. Uh, What's happening now, which is sort of interesting and ironic, is that uh, uh, the right wing of the Republican caucus uh, is using those same tactics to gain leverage on their own caucus or their own leadership. And so most of the dysfunction that I see going on is within the Republican Party. The Republicans, of course, control both the House and the Senate. And uh, th- they've got a real fight going on on, on many issues between the far right uh, members of their caucus and uh, those who are more moderate and want to try to try to get things done. So uh, that's that's a sort of a perspective, at least, on it, which occurs to me. Well, the way that I see it writ largest is with the efforts to repeal and replace the Affordable Care Act, because um, they are not the Republicans are not unified in their approach to this, and. Uh, What we found in the House, I know we're talking about the Senate now, but in the House, when some of those moderate Republican lawmakers went to their home districts, people were very angry with them, Mm -hmm. and um, they were happy to just pass the ball on to the Senate. Right. So, and now I hear that in some of the home districts, the senators are still getting the same thing, that you're, you know, that this is the death penalty if if, if we're without... What, how many millions of people, 24 million, are without health insurance? Mm-hmm. People will die. So um, what do you think about the Democratic approach to this, which seems to be, you know, watch the battle and, well, you just tell me, how do you think it's, it, how might it play out? Well, I, I'm not sure how it's going to play out, but, uh, you know, the way I see it, the, a main motivation for this whole idea of repeal and replace, which they've been chanting here for seven years, Republican members of Congress have been chanting. Um, A main motivation for that is they want to repeal the tax increases that were included in that bill in order to pay for the expansion of coverage. And uh, particularly they want to repeal the tax increases that apply to the the wealthiest. Uh, we, We increase the the tax on investment income by 3.8 percent, which is a pretty big increase, and uh, and that's very objectionable uh, to many of them. They don't talk about that as much, but but that's a main uh, motivation for what's going on, and that's why it's difficult to get a compromise because uh, Democrats approached this whole idea of ta- ta- of uh, 
reforming the the health care laws with the idea we're going to pay for this. We're going to find we a way to. to get the money. Yeah. We're yeah. not just going to add it to the deficit. We're going to pay for it, and that's what we did. And and by doing that, we we sort of uh, set up a, a very difficult situation. A lot of the Republican members feel they can't support anything that does not repeal those taxes. So uh, they're they're in a in a difficult position at this point. Uh, uh, and as you point out, uh, the, the House bill originally proposed by Paul Ryan said that 24 million would lose coverage. Then they passed the bill that said 23 million will lose coverage. Now the Senate is about to vote on a bill which says that only 22 million will lose coverage. Um, but they're, they're all sort of uh, uh, in the same ballpark, uh, and they're all pretty devastating to a lot of people. So if this is... I mean, they say we want to keep our promises. So many promises have already been broken. Right. You know, why go down, you know, right. uh, with the ship on this one? But what I'm wondering is, if the issue might really be the way to do this, is there a chance that single-payer, Medicare for all, could possibly enter onto this battlefield of broken bodies and chaos? Well... I, I, I doubt that it could at this stage. Uh, in fact, uh, instead of uh, considering single payer, which would be a, essentially a expanded entitlement of Medicare, that's, that's what people generally mean by single payer. Instead of considering that, the proposal instead uh, in this new version of the reform bill that's coming in the Senate is to uh, block grant Medicaid and Medicaid, of course, is has always been an entitlement. Uh, we have just about 900,000 people in New Mexico right now who get coverage through Medicaid. And if if in fact they do pass something and it gets to become law uh, that block grants Medicaid, you're going to see a dramatic reduction in the amount of federal funding coming into the state for health care services in in future years and. Uh, so, so if our state legislature is worried about how they can make a budget now, wait till they block grant Medicaid, uh, then they'll really find out how difficult it is. And a huge percent of, of the births in New Mexico, birthing a baby, is paid for by Medicaid. Yeah. And um, that's a heck of a way to start out with not covering yeah. even the birth of a child. So it, it's... It's, we just watch and wait and we'll see. Um, I'm glad they didn't ram it through before the 4th of July break because right. I think it's important for the lawmakers to get some feedback. Another controversial issue for New Mexico is the Trump administration's uh, desire to reverse some of our national monument designations. Uh, the Obama administration did two beauties, the um, Oregon, Mount, Oregon Peaks Desert what? Right, it's the Oregon Mountains and Desert Peaks That's down it, in yeah. Las Cruces or Doniana County. And the Rio Grande del Norte. Right. Um, so just in today's paper I read they want to hurry up and, and facilitate the drilling permits so they can start drilling in all these places. What... Well, how do you think it's going to play out? Well, I don't know that they have uh, that the president has the legal authority to to come along and change the designation of national monuments that his predecessors as president have have uh, have made. Uh, you know, I think when Congress wrote the Antiquities Act, and that's the authority that President Obama used in designating uh, both of the monuments you mentioned in New Mexico. When uh, President Obama used that Antiquities Act, uh, uh, the, the, whole I, the whole idea of that act is to allow the president to set aside for particular uh, additional protection certain areas that he considers, he or she considers to be uh, particularly uh, important. Uh, to, to think that every president that gets elected can come back and change, change that designation uh, I don't think that's what was intended when the Antiquities Act was passed. Of course, that's a legal issue. Uh, I'm sure it'll be litigated if the if the Trump administration goes ahead in trying to reverse what Obama did. I'm concerned about the glacial pace of such litigation. There's 
litigation against this administration for violating the emoluments clause. Right. And there are a lot of ethics issues, but by the time that right. moves through the court, we'll be halfway through the first term. No question. Uh, the, uh, all of the litigation that is is uh, adding uh, every day, it seems every week, there's there's some new new things which are being challenged. And the state attorneys general, particularly the Democratic attorneys general of the various states, our own included, are uh, are taking the lead in challenging a lot of these actions by the Trump administration. Um, the voter, this... Chris Kovach, of all people, who invented something called cross-check, which threw a lot of uh, voters off of the rolls of 29 states that all had Republican secretaries of state, he's now in charge of this, I think it's called the voter integrity. Anyway, I'm concerned about votes, voter suppression. Yeah. And again, the, the legal challenges to this, although many of the secretaries of states have said, we are not publishing our yeah. voters' social security number and their voting record. And it's, but a lot of them said we won't, and they'd already done it. Oh, really? 21 states had already done it while saying, oh, no, we'd never. Oh, I see. So, I didn't realize that many states had, had already done it. I, I know that there were, uh, I, I saw a number of 41 states that said they would not. 41 said they wouldn't. Yeah. But um, in January, uh, after the inauguration, a lot of them had already done it, sent it personally to Chris Kovach as the Kansas Secretary of State. It, what, it, now they want to have it on the president's website, this complete hackable mm. directory of all of our voters and who they voted for. Well, one of the things I trust you so much about is your work with climate change and energy, head of the Energy Committee. And when you s stepped away from the Senate after 30 years, tell us about the project you did at Stanford and what we learned from that. Then I want to talk about climate change and the policies of, yeah. Well, the project uh, that I worked on out at the Stanford Law School, they have a center there on energy policy and, and energy finance. And, and I uh, spent some time there in 2013 and 2014 uh, working uh, uh, also with George Schultz, who is at the Hoover Institute and mm -hmm. used to be Secretary of State, of course. Um, uh, working on a on a report about state initiatives to to expand the use of alternative energy, and uh, and we did a we basically uh, surveyed what the states had done and then wrote a report highlighting those efforts that we thought were most successful. And what efforts were? Well, of course, California is way ahead of the rest yeah. of the country. Uh, as far as their their emphasis on promoting renewable energy, uh, they they have a what they call a renewable portfolio standard there, which is a requirement on utilities to produce a certain percentage of their power from renewable sources, and and theirs is uh, I think it's now scheduled to go up to 50 percent, uh, and, and we're we're of course. Uh, uh, way back in the pack, uh, New Mexico is, and there's been very little attention to it here in recent years, unfortunately. But for our economy, our struggling New Mexico economy, uh, solar and renewable energy is one of the most expanding job markets and business markets. I and mean, this is where we should certainly invest or certainly have a tax structure that favors these kind of efforts, because between healthcare and green energy, that's where the jobs are. Yeah, and, and obviously there's no state in the country that has more claim to solar energy than yeah. we do. Yeah. But uh, you're right, we, we, uh, we are not, to my mind at any rate, we are not pursuing a balanced energy uh, uh, portfolio in the state at this time. We, we are way too focused on uh, supporting more and more production of fossil fuels, which is great, and, and it's created a lot of jobs in New Mexico, continues to, but uh, that's only one of the potential sources of energy, and we need to, we need to be uh, uh, competing with other states to, to uh, produce these other kinds of energy right. as well. Wind and algae, there's a great algae farm on the east side of the state. Yeah. It's exciting, these new possibilities, and I just don't think we should rule them out. I think yeah. we, we sh 
you know, there's room for it all. Oil and gas has been very good to us. It's, yeah. it's supported our state for a long time. We can keep that, but we can still move on toward the yeah. renewables. I agree. And the fact that one state, California, is just doing this on their own. They're entering into climate agreements with other nations yeah. as a state, not as a nation. No, well, with the, the Trump administration's position on climate change, uh, I, I do think that uh, people like Governor Jerry Brown there in California, uh, there's a vacuum to fill, and he's stepping up and trying to fill it, and it's obviously difficult for a governor to step up and say, most of the country doesn't support the policy of the national government. Mm -hmm. They support the policy that we're pursuing here in California. But I think uh, that, in fact, is the case uh, in, when, when we talk about climate change. And one thing that aids him in that, isn't California the seventh or eighth largest economy in the world? Yeah, no, it is. And, and they sort of uh, set their own rules. And, uh, and on a lot of things, they have been much more uh, forward-looking and, and far-sighted than, than the country as a whole. Now, we're speaking today with Senator Jeff Bingaman, who is our New Mexico Senator for 30 years, and I've invited you here because of the statesman-like quality that you always had as a Senator, and I've asked you, to, from your perspective, a way of looking at some of the things that are going on nationally. The diplomacy is another area that worries me a lot. Um, the State Department has been gutted. I mean, they're just, they got rid of all the old hundreds of people who knew, who had specialized in one part of the world or one co country. They knew the entire history, the language, everything, and poof, they're gone. And we're going into some very important diplomatic arenas, really, with two hands tied behind our back. So how, I'm, I'm very concerned about yeah. literally the state of the nation. Well, I agree. That I agree with your concern. Uh, there's no doubt that uh, you know a lot of the people who go into the State Department as Foreign Service officers uh, have alternative things they can do. I mean, they are not just looking for a job. They yeah. they really are qualified to do a lot of different things. So they have the freedom and the independence to go somewhere else if they determine that this is not for them. They're not making a contribution. Their advice isn't being considered. Uh, and so uh, I think that's what's driving a lot of people out. And, uh, of course, the, m the administration's proposed cuts in funding for the State Department have been dramatic, and uh, they haven't been enacted yet at those levels. But, but I think it's been a strong signal to people working in the State Department that, that diplomacy is not a priority uh, for the new administration. Thank you. Uh, you know, we'll wait and see. It just the diplomatic core. It, there's so many, you know, things that are just part of everyday life. If you're stuck in a country, your embassy will help you. If your passport is stolen, there's a lot of like everyday life things that we need an intact diplomatic core for. Right. And if we don't have that, then things get a lot more complicated. Um, so, I always worry about when things become partisan, but you have not been the the kind of partisan politician that now we see a lot more in the Senate. You worked always with the other side. Well, you and Senator Domenici worked together on so many things. He a Republican, you a Democrat. So how, what would you tell the Senate members that you still know, you still know most of them, how to step aside from this uh, embattle partisanship and remember that the calling of a statesman is f for the good of the nation. Well, I do think there are there are some some good people on the Republican side of the aisle in the Senate who would like to work more in a bipartisan way. And uh, unfortunately, I don't know that uh, Mitch McConnell, who is the Republican leader, is particularly inclined toward uh, looking for opportunities for bipartisan cooperation. I think he may find that he has to do that in the case of health care reform in order to shore up the current uh, health care system uh, and so that the, he doesn't take a lot of criticism uh, for the collapse 
of, of uh, coverage. But uh, it's difficult. It's very difficult for individual members of the Republican Party to step aside, step across the aisle, and work with Democrats if, if their own leadership is trying mm -hmm. to prevent that. Mm -hmm. and, and unfortunately, we've had that. I think we had that, frankly, when the Affordable Care Act was passed. Right. I think, in fact, uh, Mitch McConnell uh, wrote a book uh, where he takes great credit in having been able to keep all Republicans from voting for that bill. Uh, and uh, we, we did have one Republican who voted for the bill when we reported it out of the Finance Committee, Olympia Snow, voted, oh, yes. voted for it. But by the time it got to the floor and was called for a final vote, she, uh, she had been uh, persuaded to go against it. So uh, as it turned out, of course, it was totally partisan. And uh, I think over, in spite of very heroic efforts to, to make it bipartisan. Um, you had mentioned the many State Department employees and diplomats just choosing to be professors at universities or to join think tanks. Uh, recently, the head of the Ethics Review Committee uh, Commission has stepped down and just said, they are ignoring me. There, you know, there is conflict of interest here. We have to pursue it. But I can't get anyone to pay. And of course, it has no teeth, this commission. Right. So he stepped down and he felt that he could do more in a nonprofit than he could as a White House employee. Yeah. Although he had served through several presidents and, and, uh, and had a very fine sense, I think, of conflict of interest that is so obvious they really leap up, mm -hmm. leap up at you. Um, what can we do about the ethics issues? I mean, this, this, you, know, you either know right from wrong or you don't. Yeah. No, I do think it's a serious problem. I, I think that uh, trying to get some reasonable enforcement of the ethics rules uh, uh, at this current time with, uh, uh, with the current uh, folks in office, I, I think it's going to be difficult. And uh, uh, so I don't, I don't have a solution for that. I, I well, wish I did. you know, none of, none of, it's, it's important to talk about it, but I haven't yeah. seen some of these Well, one, the one, one pot you know, if in fact after the next election you had one of the two houses of Congress uh, under Democratic control, which is possible, if that were to happen, then, uh, of course, the Congress itself could step in in its oversight role and, and have hearings and, and yeah. insist on enforcement of laws which uh, may not get a lot of attention otherwise. Well, that's what, you know, our founders set it up with these checks and balances. Right. And, and it's unusual that the Republicans have the House, the Senate, and the White House. And so I look forward to a more balanced, where they can you know, check, and check each other on mm -hmm. extreme behavior. But, you know, I don't know what we can do. It's, it is a little like watching a car wreck. <laughs> and, and we can't look away. Right. And for the first couple of months, there were like body blows. Things would be happening that were so hard for a normal person who studied government and who believes that this, our system can work. Right. So are we resilient enough to survive these blows to our system? Well, I, th I think we are. I think clearly the, some of these blows are doing some damage to us and to our system of government. But uh, I think we're resilient enough to come back and, uh, and uh, get, get the trains back on the track and, and keep moving forward. Uh, it may take a while, but uh, uh, I, I hope we are, and I think we are. Yeah. I would like to see civics being taught in schools again. Yeah. You know, because this really, remember when they asked Ben Franklin when he was at the early conventions, well, what do we have? He said, you have a republic if you can keep it. Right. And we're not doing too well at keeping it right now, it seems no, to me. No, I agree. I agree. He... Uh, he had a lot of insight when he was uh, suggesting that it was up to the people to, to keep the, the government functioning the way it needed to function. So to me, a statesman is a person who puts the nation ahead of partisan interests mm -hmm. and who really works toward the betterment of our country. And I'm mm -hmm. not seeing a lot of that right now. I'm seeing a lot of partisan interests. 
a lot of um, monetary interests being served. How do we, like you say, put the train back on the track? It's the wheels in the groove. Yeah. Well, I, I don't know. As I, I think, I think people need to be sure that the people they're voting for, their representatives in Congress, are in fact pursuing policies that are in the public interest, and uh, and uh, there there'll be opportunities uh, as, as we go into this next election cycle for people to to express their views on that, and I hope they do. Well, I'm grateful that you came and shared your views to help me during this time. Uh, what are you doing immediately after you left the Senate? You did all this work on uh, renewable energy. Uh, what are you doing now? Well, I'm on some nonprofit boards. I've been doing on a couple of study committees that the National Academies of Science in Washington uh, set up, one on uh, the high price of prescription drugs. We're going to come out with a report, we hope, in the next uh, month or two, uh, making recommendations for how to deal with that. Uh, we did a report that uh, I was involved with on uh, how we can do a better job of training people for technical jobs mm -hmm. in our economy. And uh, and I'm on an advisory panel for Sandia Labs on, on energy and climate change. And, I'm on the uh, the Santa Fe Community Foundation oh, board, those kinds of things. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And spending a lot of time uh, with our, our son and his wife and uh, our granddaughter are now living here in Santa oh, Fe. So, yeah. so we get to see them. Good, good. Well, I want to thank you. Our guest today is Senator Jeff Bingaman, a true statesman, and I really appreciate your coming and, and helping me work through our contemporary Washington situation. Thank you. Well, I wish I had more answers or more solutions to the problems you've raised. I actually think that this kind of discussion, it makes people start thinking, and who knows what people will come up, so I'm grateful for it. Thank you. And I'm Lorene Mills. I'd like to thank you, our audience, for being with us today on Report from Santa Fe. We'll see you next time. Past archival programs of Report from Santa Fe are available at the website reportfromsantafe.com. If you have questions or comments, please email info at reportfromsantafe.com. Report from Santa Fe is made possible in part by grants from the members of the National Education Association of New Mexico, an organization of professionals who believe that investing in public education is an investment in our state's economic future, and by a grant from the Healy Foundation, Taos, New Mexico.